He is a veteran of the Vietnam War era. He is a jet pilot and a trainer of jet pilots and a minister of the gospel. He is Pastor Bill Warcholock and this is our conversation. Pastor Bill, thank you very much for joining me on Conversations. I appreciate it. It's my pleasure. So let's begin at the beginning. Uh, I'll cover a couple of facts, if you like, and then we'll go back and cover the story. So you served your nation during the Vietnam War era. Yes. In Vietnam? No, not in Vietnam. Where, where were you? I was in Arizona most of my time as an instructor pilot. Okay, as an instructor pilot, you were instructing pilots to fly, one would expect to fly what? Well, the goal is to finish at the top of your class when you're going through UPT, undergraduate pilot training. And the last aircraft is the supersonic aircraft. Quite a story because they found out that they needed to manufacture a plane that could be used for training pilots. Because if you start, you start off in a basic plane, like I don't want to give a brand name, but just a single propeller plane, uh, and you learn how to do the discipline that's needed to follow the instructions and the protocols and the procedures. Well, after that, you go up to a subsonic jet plane. It was a T-37 back then. They have new planes now that they're using. The beauty of that is you find out how to fly a jet, but they fly differently depending on what kind of plane you have, subsonic, supersonic. So you have to learn how to fly the, the difference, make a difference between those two kind of planes because that, they lost a lot of pilots early on when they started supersonic flying because, first of all, they didn't have tandem seats, so you only had one person in the plane. You didn't have an instructor who could be in the plane with you to teach you how to use it, how to fly it. And the performance is so different, and I could explain that sometime if you, if you wanted it. Aerodynamically, it's a fascinating difference. The reactions you need to be safe when you're flying the uh, supersonic are the opposite of what you need in the subsonic plane. How fast do these supersonic things go? Ours went about Mach 1.2 or 1.3. That's 1,100, 1,200 miles an hour, roughly speaking. Uh, and you, you flew those things? Yes. So yes. there you were up in the sky hurtling across the continent at 1,200 miles an hour. You could say that, yes. Yeah, yeah. yes. We, I was in the training version, so we went cross-country on flights. That was good. Um, but it was an exciting plane to fly. Actually, it held the world rate of climb record in the 1960s. You can go from parked on the runway to 30,000 feet in 89 seconds. I can only imagine what that feels like. It feels good. <laughs> yeah, it does, huh? Yeah. yeah. Hey, Bill, we've got a, a lot to talk about. We've got to get back to flying planes, and we'll talk about planes and pilots and the military and all that. But let's go back. Where are you from? Where did you begin? Because, you know, we know where you ended up, mm -hmm. uh, at least most recently, right here sitting with me at It Is Written, and you've been part of our It Is Written ministry team, now as a volunteer, uh, not long ago as, as, as you know, a, a team member on the front lines. So you wound up in ministry, but you started, uh, uh, I say this, I, I think fairly accurately, quite a long way from ministry. So, so let's go back to where you began and what was your childhood like? What was your, your family life like? Seymour, Connecticut was the place where I grew up. We didn't practice religion in our family. No morning worship or Bible reading or anything like that. Uh, my family, however, my father was Russian Orthodox, uh, but he didn't attend regularly, maybe for special events. My uncle actually was the leader of the local um, Orthodox, Russian Orthodox congregation there in Ansonia, Connecticut. So Wojciech, that's a, that's a Russian name? Yeah, it? it's, yeah, actually, the story is that it's a Polish word. They tell me that it means brawler, a fighter. Oh, oh really? <laughs> yeah, maybe you understand if I tell you that, that part of the story, because um, when my relatives came from Russia, from the Carpathian Mountains area, uh, over to the United States, the first thing they would do, this is 1900 we're talking about, they would go to the coal mines in Pennsylvania to earn enough money to come back where there was a Russian Orthodox group of people and you'd get a job there. Well, the job of choice for my great-grandfather was to open a saloon during the 1920s when it was illegal. Yeah, you got some characters <laughs> in your family tree. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. So it was fascinating to see how uh, in our little town, my father's being Russian Orthodox, my mother was raised Methodist, my sister converted to Judaism when she was in college. And I went to the local uh, Episcopal church because I had friends that went there. 
And so we were, we'd hang out there. And by the way, you know I ended up as a pastor, of course, as you mentioned. But the pastor there I respected. He used to hang out with the kids. We had a basketball court inside the church building in the basement and bowling alley. Oh, really? Yeah. And he Boy. would come down and he'd bowl and he'd shoot baskets and yeah. everything. Really nice guy. And I became an acolyte when I got to be about 12 years old, was confirmed there. Uh, and the fascinating thing about that experience was I saw this man who was so caring and kind, I thought, well, you know, I'd like to be kind of like him. So it, it was a good experience growing up, but a diversity of religion. It, it's fascinating, isn't it, how as a, as a child you were impressed by a, a religious leader, a, a clergyman, a minister. Yeah. It's really interesting, isn't it? We must never forget that in our interactions with people, some of them um, clearly very important, others maybe sort of a, of a passing nature. Those interactions can really impress particularly young minds. Really? I remember very clearly how we would be, I'd be serving at the altar with the pastor there during church services. And I had my responsibilities like count the people so I know how much communion stuff to prepare for. Them. Anyway, have little d details like that. But the amazing thing is I would kneel there and we would have uh, like a Christmas or Easter program or other programs. And I felt something there. There's, there's something about this, uh, about this religion that brings peace and brings a quiet joy. And so I had that sense in my life. And it, it dawned on me that I might consider being a pastor someday. It did, huh? Yeah. I told my girlfriend when I was as a teenager, I told my girlfriend that, uh, that I thought I might be a pastor someday because we were kind of seriously involved. And she said, a pastor? You? <laughs> So, 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 <laughs> so you weren't one of those likely candidates for ministry. Right. Like, so if I'd, if, I'd, if I'd pulled three or four of your close friends aside and I said, Bill over there is thinking of being a pastor, what would they have said? Uh, they would have said, I don't think so. And, but why? Uh, my lifestyle was not ideal for a pastor. I was kind of uh, like the adventurous side of life, which is okay. But one of the reasons I became uh, the president of our senior class in high school was because I enjoyed people and I hung out with all the different groups in the school. So by that experience just taught me how to relate to people. And I enjoyed being with people. Uh, but that meant I hung out with some people who weren't the highest moral standard. And I was involved in some of those lower moral standard things. So that's, that's why they would have said, I'm not sure about that. Yeah, so you were, uh, f for the want of a better expression, you were a well-rounded individual. That's a kind way to put it. Yeah, yes. yeah. there you go. <laughs> High school went well for you? Yes, an interesting experience. This has a, a real good spiritual sense for me, and that is on my first day of school, we had a brand new high school, senior high school, sophomore, junior, senior. First day of school, we're all gathering out there outside on the, on the front walk. There's hundreds of kids there, and I'm just minding my own business. I'm a smaller, shorter person, and I'm trying to stay out of trouble here on my first day in this new school. Uh, and as I'm standing there with my books, the elementary school bully, who I knew very well, uh, walked over to me and knocked my books down. And he said, pick them up. And I looked around, everybody's now watching me, hundreds of students, first day of school, right? So I bend down, I pick them up, and then he knocks them down again. He says, pick them up. And I thought, Oh God, who I don't really know, but oh God, can I get out of this school and go to some other school after this? This is a disaster. First day of school, I'm not going to be picked on by the whole school. This is terrible. This is a nightmare. So I picked up my books again. And as I was getting to my feet, all of a sudden I hear this commotion. And I look up. The senior class, this was a junior class bully. The senior class bully leader picks up the junior class leader, puts him against the brick wall and says, don't ever touch my friend again. Oh, really? <laughs> I'm golden. <laughs> my, my whole high school career is perfect. I'm protected by the biggest kid in the, in the whole class. I just couldn't believe it. So this is divine intervention from early on in life, I'll tell you. Did you recognize it as such at the time? I was well, sort of. I mean, I, it was more survival mode, I was thinking. Yeah. But, but now looking back on it, I see, you know, this imprinted me that when you're in big trouble, there's some bigger solution. 
I believe God does that, you know. He'll, he'll, he'll speak to you as a, as a kid. He might say to you, I have a future for you in ministry. Mm -hmm. He might say to you, did you see what happened there? These sorts of things were happening to you as you were, as you were growing up. Yes, that, that's possible, sure. So you ended up f flying jet planes. So you must have done okay in school academically. What, what, tell me about your academic leanings back then, because I'm fascinated in this long journey, or well, this mm -hmm. journey, to pastoral ministry, frontline, soul winning, growing the church. So this, this individual was being shaped back then. How, how did things look for you academically when you were in high school? I was pretty much a B-plus student. Uh, my cousin, interestingly, was an A-minus student or an A student. So we had a little friendly competition. In fact, he and I were running for class president, senior class, huh? at the same time. Uh, and it was okay, you know, you're just doing your best to uh, reach a goal. And I think that's a key point. You're looking for a commitment that can allow you to reach goals. So that requires dedication. That's what you're asking about academics. The yeah. thing is, because of the well-rounded personality, I wanted to be talking to people and doing things and not just studying. So that, uh, that was part of my, my focus. When I wanted to focus on something, I could. Can, can I share this thought too? So when I was confirmed uh, at 12 years old in the Episcopal Church, they hadn't studied the Bible, but they gave me one when we graduated. I took that Bible that day and went back to my house and I thought I'd never had a Bible. I'd never read the Bible, uh, although the pastor read it in church. And interestingly, when this went off, uh, when, this, when I had this Bible, I laid down on my bed that afternoon, beautiful day in Connecticut, and I looked at the Bible, I thought it has two parts, and the short part is the New Testament, so I'll start reading there because I can't read the whole big book. I got as far as Matthew chapter 5, verse 5. It said, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. I closed the book. I said, this is a good book, but it doesn't work because I'm in junior high school and if you're meek you get beat up so I closed it I didn't really? open I didn't open it again until I was a senior in high school and that time my girlfriend at that time was Roman Catholic on Christmas Eve she said we all have to go to church now and I said I'm watching television leave me alone it's midnight mass I don't want to yeah. go anywhere. and fascinatingly they insist that I go but to be kind I said well look I'll read the Bible so I'll show you I'm being religious, but while well, you go to church. And they didn't like that, but uh, I did. So they left the church, I opened the Bible, and I got to Matthew again. Christmas story, very nice, Christmas Eve. Yeah. I got as far as chapter 6, verse 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. I closed it again. He said, I don't know anybody who does that except the minister in our church who lives by the word of God. And I thought, well, I'm, I'm not a minister, and I don't know if I'll ever be a minister, so I'm not going to pay attention to the book. And you put the book down. I put the book down. Huh. I went away to college and drifted away from religious things. That's so interesting. You, you read the Bible, and what you found in the Bible encouraged you to put the Bible down and not read any further, which I'm sure is not a unique experience, but it's, you know, it's not the story you expect someone to hear. I'm expecting, I read the Bible and I read this verse, seek ye first, and I heard angel choirs, and <laughs> that was it. At that moment, everything changed. It kind of did change. What did you study in college? I started off with a major in physics. Big mistake because I volunteered for the uh, advanced division of physics, and I had a poor training in high school for that. So I uh, flunked physics, but I got an A in math the math class, because I had studied calculus on my own the summer before. I went to a, a local college and took calculus. And when I got there, I knew the calculus with no problem. So I got an A in that, F in physics. So I thought I'd have to find a better career path. So my career path became, I looked up different career paths and I thought, okay, I wanna be a park ranger. So the first thing I'll do is I'll work as a park ranger this coming summer. And then when I finish that, I'll join the Air Force because that way I'll get higher ratings and I can be a national park ranger because with, as a veteran you'd have uh, an advanced uh, opportunity for it. Uh, and it was a fascinating story because I called the uh, park ranger to offer to work that summer. And I told them what I wanted to do. I have a career path. I'm going to be a geologist. I took to geology major so I'd be out in the nature. Uh, and I said, so that's what I want to do. And I said, uh, so I'd like a job. He said, yep. 
And I said, um, so uh, is there an application? He said, nope. I said, well, um, when should I show up for work? And he said, May. And the conversation went just like that. And finally hung up and I said, do I have a job or don't I? <laughs> That's amazing, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. So anyway, I worked as a park ranger because now I had my career path marked out. I yeah. was going to work outside. I liked geology, which I changed my major to. You, you were studying geology? Yes, in college. Uh, all about evolutionary geology, of course, which I didn't know the difference at that point. Didn't know about creationism. But fascinating when uh, my career path was marked out, I joined the ROTC so I could be in, in the Air Force. So why the Air Force? What, what drew you to the Air Force? Speed. I always drove uh, cars too fast. Don't tell the kids about that, you know, but uh, I always drove too fast. I always pushed things to the limit. And how much could I, how close to the edge could I get going around corners, doing racing things? I did a lot of stupid things. And it's only by the grace of God that I lived yeah, through those, those years. Uh, uh. Having said that, though, uh, you're a B plus student in high school. Mm -hmm. One wouldn't expect I mean, if I was a B-plus student, I might, not, I might be thinking about maybe not being a pilot, but maybe, I don't know, maybe putting the gas in a gas tank. I mean, that was, that was a pretty big ambition to think I'm going to become a pilot. I'm going to ace this thing. Mm -hmm. what, what in the world made you think you're going to get to behind the wheel of your own plane when you're merely a B-plus student in high school? I envisioned myself as uh, being able to get whatever I focused my attention on, that I could achieve this. I could gain that. Uh, just like um, winning the election to be president of the senior class, I was also the, uh, in the Explorer Scouts and the Drum and Bugle Corps, and I was one of the leaders of that, and uh, became the president of the local council uh, of Explorer Scouts. So I had a lot of leadership things, and that fit in well with the pastor looking down what w was in my future. But it was really a, uh, an exciting time for me to set goals, and I thought, you know, I'm going to kill myself if I keep driving cars fast. It's illegal. I'll get arrested or something. So I need to go someplace where I can go fast, have the adrenaline rush, and it be legal. Did you, did you enjoy uh, being a part, working in the, in the national parks or as a park ranger? Did you I like loved it? it. Yeah, loved it. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so you got in there. You spent your summer with that taciturn man, or, or maybe you didn't. <laughs> he was. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so you thought, this is me. This is the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. You did the Air Force Y just as a means to an end? Yeah, it helped. Well, it filled, it filled that need for the adrenaline rush, um, the excitement of it all. I guess it was some of the glory of being a, a, a fighter pilot. Sure. And that was my goal, really. I was going to fly the, like the RF-4 was the premier plane at that time uh, in Vietnam War. So I wanted to fly the RF-4, fly treetop level, 600 miles an hour, and it takes pictures, and hopefully you don't get shot down. Yeah. The neat thing is, at that speed, you, over the treetops over there, by the time somebody points a gun, you're over there. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I have a niece who's a, not a fighter pilot, but she's an Air Force pilot. Nice. Yeah, she, she tra she's trains pilots now. She flew KC-135s, I think. Nice, refuelers. Into, uh, into uh, the Middle East, into uh, yeah. Afghanistan and Iraq. And yeah. got a little, she, she thrived on adrenaline too, evidently. that she was, There was plenty of that flowing when she was flying in and I'm out of the sure. Middle East. So. Yeah. It's a, it's a wonderful thing. And she's, she's still uh, training pilots and doing just a great, great job. Nice. Not in this country, but in another part of the world. Nice. So you got into the Air Force. Where, where did you go? Was this Arizona? Uh, Texas was my base. It was Laughlin Air Force Base. And there, um, I enjoyed it. But I was, I was really motivated. And this, this is an interesting part of the story. I studied on the weekends. It's a year-long program. And I studied on the weekends when the rest of the student pilots were out partying because I had my goal. The goal was I'm going to finish at the top of the class so I can pick the RF4 that I want. Yeah, fantastic. And so with that, with that focus, I found out something very important, and that is that when I knew the answers in the classes and things, the other students who were struggling would ask me questions to help them. And I would say, okay, we're going to go down to the flight line. I'm going to drill you on these procedures. And I found out a couple of things. Number one, I enjoyed teaching. I enjoyed helping people. And I did better mm. because I was teaching somebody else. Yeah, sure, sure. And that helped propel me to the top of the class. Along the way, you became a Christian. You became a minister. Lots of other things happened in your life. I'm keen mm -hmm. to hear about it all. He is Pastor Bill Warchalik. I'm John Bradshaw. This is our conversation. Back with more in just a moment.
Hello, I'm Dr. Wes Youngberg, and I've just written a book called Memory Makeover, How to Prevent Alzheimer's and Reverse Cognitive Decline. This book is in story form. It's case studies of individuals that I've worked with and my colleagues have worked with where they've actually been able to stop cognitive decline and 80% of the time have been able to reverse aspects of cognitive decline. If you want to know more about that, get the book Memory Makeover. With superheroes being big business, we ask ourselves what heroes really look like. A man in a fast food restaurant wrestles a gun out of the hands of a killer. A man in Canada risks his life to save a woman being attacked by a polar bear. A young man attempts to run across a continent to raise money for cancer research. The Medal of Honor is awarded to United States servicemen and women who've committed acts of uncommon valor. Heroes. But what's a hero, really? And who is the greatest hero of them all? Join me for The Hero. Learn that real greatness, true heroism is found in service and discover the identity of the real hero who has saved more lives than anyone else in history. Don't miss The Hero, brought to you by It Is Written TV. Welcome back to Conversations. My guest is Pastor Bill Warchalak, a veteran of the Vietnam War era, a jet pilot. A moment ago, you had uh, joined the Air Force. This was at least in part to, uh, to minister to your need for speed. Your plan was to become a park ranger, even though as a kid you thought, maybe I'll be a pastor one day. That wasn't in your plan right now. Tell me about your Air Force experience briefly. What was that like? I enjoyed it very much. Um, it gave me an outlet for leadership. And the idea of being an instructor pilot, and by the way, the reason that happened is because God changed the plan. I was expecting to get the RF-4. And that you would have had to be in the top in your class exactly. if you had chosen that. Exactly. Didn't work out. It didn't work out. I finished second in the class. Oh. And this was the real odd thing because we always had, in previous assignment blocks, we always had three or four F-4s and one or two RF-4s. Our block came down, there was one F-4, no RF-4s, and the top guy, of course, took the F-4. If I'd finished at the top, I would have taken it, I would have been to Vietnam, I might not be here right now, for sure. <laughs> so that would have changed your life, whether you'd survive Vietnam or not. Exactly. That would have really changed your life, or potentially. Right. Okay, so you didn't get the F-4, what did you do? The only other fast plane was the T-38 as an instructor pilot. And I said, well, I'll take that. They're still flying those things, aren't they? The astronauts still use that for their training. Hey, speaking of astronauts, so you're flying, this is the 60s, because it's Vietnam era. Who were your, who were your heroes then? Who were the, the, the mm. was it Chuck Yeager, John Glenn? Were you talking about their exploits? Were there any pilots that sort of fired you up or that wasn't really a factor? I enjoyed reading about those stories, but my focus was on what my career path was going to be. And what did you think your career path was going to be? Where was this leading you? I was wondering whether I would stay in for the 20 years in the Air Force. Um, it was interesting that, uh, just backing up a little bit, in college, I was the uh, commander of the Arnold Air Society, which is the elite group of people in the Air Force ROTC program. And I was a commander of that. So interestingly, I also uh, was able to stay in the ROTC building. And one night, because part of my responsibility to stay there for free was to clean the building. One night I went past the commander's desk and it had a file on it, and I glanced at it, it had my name on it. Oh. So I thought, should I look at this? Well, it's my name, I'll look at it. So I opened it up, and the uh, TO, the training officer for summer camp, boot camp, that I went through, had written up, this guy will never make it as, a, as an officer, will never make it as a pilot. And I thought, this guy who was pretty much an alcoholic is doing that to my character? Well, that gave me a little more inspiration that I'm going to finish at the top of my class. Interestingly, I finished, I got the top officer award uh, in our graduating class from pilot training. So you set goals, you have to work toward them. And that was uh, 
uh, a goal that I had that was very clear. Mm. Uh, and so I was blessed by God intervening, even though I didn't know him personally. You trained pilots for some time? Yes, yes. Yeah. It was a five-year program that yeah. I was in. And was that as satisfying as you had hoped it would be? Yes. Yeah? Yes. And that begins us to transition, really, to how the change came to total commitment to Christianity. I'm interested in this. You know, I've been, you, you, you raised in what was, sound like a pretty good family, and you had cousins nearby, so you had extended family. You mm -hmm. mentioned your cousin and you were, were in high school together, and, right. and you did well in school, and God kind of prodded you a couple of times mm -hmm. that you were aware of, many more times that you might not have been aware of. And then you're on this path, you, you're, a, you're a, I mean, this is big stuff. You're a high achiever, flying uh, supersonic jet aircraft for the US government. I mean, that's, that's big stuff. By the way, thank you for your service to this country. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. I, I, every time I come across a veteran, I wanna thank them for, for serving and for volunteering and for urging this nation and this world forward. I'm very grateful for that. Now there's a transition. You're a minister of the gospel today, mm -hmm. so something happened. How did you come to faith in Jesus? A great question, which I love to tell the story about that. My first son was on the way to being born. And as that happened, I realized I'm training students how to fly planes. But I have a child now. How am I going to educate him? How am I going to raise him? My wife at that time was Roman Catholic, and I had a casual Episcopal background. I have to know what to teach this child about God. Because I was scarred somewhat as an eight-year-old when my, one of my neighbors, older neighbors said, you don't believe in Santa Claus, do you? I was shocked. I went up to the house, told my mother, mom, uh, our neighbor just told me there's no Santa Claus. That's not right, is it, mom? She was silent. I went to my bedroom and cried. Mm. How could they lie to me about that? And I had this sense that someday when I became 21 and could be, could be a voter, I would get a letter from the governor saying, by the way, there is no God, but we want you to uh, teach that to your children. It's good for them. Of course, that didn't happen. Sure. But uh, so I was teaching students how to fly planes. I have to teach my son about everything he needs to know, and I have to decide. If there's no God, I don't want to waste my time teaching him about that. I went into my bedroom, and I knelt down, and I said, God, I don't know if you're real or not. I want to know. And um, I don't know about all these different religions that are out there. Is one of them true? They're all true? What's the deal with all these religions? And I also wonder, I, I love my career path. I'm enjoying my career. Maybe I'll become an astronaut, end up as a park ranger someday. But maybe you have a different career path for me if you're real, a real God. Mm, that's an interesting thing. So I said, God, if I'm going to ask you these three questions, I probably should do something. So I will read the Bible and I'll pray every day for a year. At the end of the year, I'll do whatever is clear. Amen. The next morning, I started reading the Bible. How far did you get this time? Good question. I started in the Old Testament because I was committed. I'm going to go through the whole Bible now. Three months later, reading the Bible every day, and some days when I was off from work, I would sit out on my patio. You know, I had, I had a sports, or no, power, a muscle car. What, what was it? It was a custom S350 Pontiac. <laughs> Stick on the floor, I put pipes on it, straight pipes. You anyway, did like speed. A nice, uh, nice uh, house, wife, child coming, you know, all the good things. And I said, I'm enjoying my career. But, you know, um, I asked these questions and I started reading through. Three months into reading the Bible, I believed in God. I didn't know the passage, right? Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. Right. I didn't know that passage. It wasn't there. I was still in the Kings, starting through the Bible. And I thought, this is beautiful. Here we have all these heroes of faith that I've been reading, the patriarchs and prophets, and now the warriors, King David. I said, I'm a warrior in the military. They had amazing things happen to them when they chose to follow God. I could have these things happen to me if I follow God. And the other alternative is you get old and you die or you crash and burn. That's a no-brainer. I choose God. I had faith in God. 
So what do you do about that? You, you, you're reading into the Kings, you say, I believe in the God who evidently inspired this book or who this book is about. What next? Did you start going to church? I did go to church with my wife. I actually studied the Catholic religion and several other religions in that search at that year. But then I got to the point, very important point, where um, I didn't understand. I'd gotten to the book of Isaiah. I didn't understand Isaiah. I hadn't gotten to the New Testament, the book of Acts, right? right. Acts chapter 8 talks about Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. So I thought, how am I going to get help understanding Isaiah? So I turned on the television on Sunday morning, hoping I'd get help from a religious program. And who came on? Who came on? This is George Vandeman at It Is Written. I Isn't watched the great? program. I called in for the book they offered, which was Planet and Rebellion. They sent it to me. The day I got home, I read the book. I thought, this answers all the questions. Why there's so much sin and suffering in the world? It's because... It's a planet in rebellion. That's the title of the book. And I'm fighting things with bombs and bullets. I didn't ever did have bombs and bullets because I was a trainer. But we're fighting evil with violence. Jesus fought it with love. Mm. This explains what's going on on the planet. So I had now this confirmation that I was on the right path here. So you're diving deeper and deeper into the Bible. Your wife was a Roman Catholic. Mm -hmm. I was raised Roman Catholic, so I understand that yeah. dynamic. I understand what it is to be a Roman Catholic who believes in the Bible, as long as it doesn't contravene tradition. I understand what it's like to be in that situation and to be confronted with the Bible. Mm -hmm. What happened? Well, the beautiful thing about it was, and this is overall evangelism, right? I didn't know the background, but here's what happened. In our conference, in the Arizona conference at that time, they had formulated a plan. They were going to broadcast it as written over the state, and the churches were going to buy in, and they're going to follow up the leads. So once people call in, and I called in after the book, I called in for the Bible studies, and somebody knocked at my door, right? Personal ministries leader for the church. Amen. Knocks at my door, and, and I say, he says, hi, I have your Bible studies. And naturally, the answer I gave was, I didn't order any Bible studies. He said, yes, you did. You called in, you got, I said, oh, those Bible studies. Oh. And he said, yeah, here they are. I'll be back next week to get, to get the lessons that you filled out. So he drives away, and I thought, well, I guess I'll do the lessons. And so I went through the lessons, and he brought the next week, this is the church plan, right? He brought the next week, he brought a college student, and he said he's going to pick up the lessons and correct them every week now, from now on. And so the college student came every week. He drove up on his motorcycle, dropped off the lessons. We never talked except to say, hi, here's the lessons. And and at the end of the months of this, he showed up with a flyer inviting people to the evangelistic series. At the you, you've been learning. If you went through a series of Bible studies like that, you got some surprises. You learned some things you weren't maybe expecting to learn. Yeah. Do you remember what that experience was like, studying oh, yeah. this and saying, well, I didn't know that. Or, yes. This is a surprise. <laughs> or, whoa, what about that? Yeah, it was really great because my wife started studying them with me just to protect. This crazy guy is looking into this stuff. She's looking at me, and she said, well, I, I have to help keep you on the right path. So I'm going to study lesson two. We got to lesson seven, which is about the Sabbath. And she said, I'm not studying these lessons anymore. These people don't even know what day you're supposed to go to church. And I said, it's in the Bible. That's what I'm studying. That's what the Bible says. So I continued the lessons. Anyway, then when he showed up at the evangelistic meeting brochure, yeah. it was in this church some kind of strange name church that I'd never heard of before. And so I went into the church building for that meeting. And there the evangelist preached. And I thought, wow, this is really interesting. He's, all the stuff that I'd been studying from the lessons, I'd finished the lessons, uh, which was part of the overall plan, evangelism after the lessons. And it was so exciting to hear him affirm from the Bible these things. And that's when it came to the crunch time. What was the crunch time? The crunch time was after about three or four meetings. I was sitting in the church. It uh, had about 125 people, more or less, who were there in the church. It looked like all adults. I didn't see any kids in the, the congregation. And they were all distinguished looking, nice people. The evangelist made an altar call. I'd never heard of an altar call, never experienced an altar call. He wanted people to come forward. And he said, close your eyes and pray. Well, I was in the military. I know how to follow orders. I closed my eyes and I bowed my head. So. 
he's going on with the altar call for some time. And after that, uh, I started to hear some voices in my head. One voice said, it's the end of the year. You said you'd follow what is truth. You know this is truth. You need to go forward. The other voice said, no, don't, don't rush into this. You know, you've got to have time to think about it. Don't make rash decisions. Go home, think about it. Don't worry. And after those voices repeated three times, I opened my eyes. And I saw up front at the altar, at the pulpit, were three children, maybe ages seven, eight, and nine. And I closed my eyes. And then the voices continued. The one said the same thing. It's the end of the year. You, you promised that you would do this. You'd, you'd follow truth. You know this is truth. The other voice said, you're a United States Air Force supersonic jet instructor pilot. You have a great career ahead of you in the Air Force. You, you know you shouldn't go forward. You can see for yourself. Religion is for little children. Those voices repeated three times. And then I had a vision. It's the only vision I've ever had in my life. It was a theater marquee, eyes closed, theater marquee, clearly written, except ye be converted and become as little children, you shall have no part in the kingdom of heaven. Mm. And I got up out of my seat, I stepped on the feet of the people next to me to get out to the aisle, and I walked down the aisle up front to be with the little children. And I kind of thought, I don't know where the rest of these adults are going, that they're not moving, but I'm going to heaven with the little kids. God knew that this proud Air Force adrenaline pilot needed to become as a child. And I would be in heaven with the kids, and that's where I wanted to be. What was the immediate impact of this decision upon your life? It was a three-week series. This was at the halfway point through the series. The pastor came and visited, cleared me for baptism, you could say, and uh, my wife, um, I didn't really tell her, but I was planning to be baptized. She, for some reason, on the Sabbath morning, it's my second Sabbath in the church, and I was in the bedroom and I came out and walked through the kitchen. I didn't expect anything. She had laid out the fine china, a magnificent breakfast. And I said, oh, I'm so sorry. I, I can't eat now because I'm going to be baptized today at the church. And I walked out. When I came home, I found out later, she would called her mother and said, I'm leaving, I'm gonna fly home because he's becoming this strange religion and I'm gonna get a divorce. Her Catholic mother said, you're a Catholic, Roman Catholic, you cannot get a divorce, you must stay there. For the next month, I walked on eggshells trying to keep peace while being faithful to God. And amazingly, she, just one day when I came home from church, one day she wasn't doing anything. I said, what you doing? She said, nothing. Would you like to go to church with me next week since you're not doing anything? She said, okay. We went to another evangelistic meeting. It was being held, and she was baptized. It's quite a story. <laughs> we haven't got all the way through it yet, but we'll get, we'll get through it a little further in just a moment with Pastor Bill Warchalik. I'm John Bradshaw. This is our conversation. Back with more in just a moment. Did you know that more than half of Jesus' parables address our relationship with money and material possessions? As God's children, we're stewards of the resources on this earth, and God has given us examples of how to do that well and wisely. As we study managing for the master till he comes, we'll learn how God asks us to care for our fellow man and how to achieve financial freedom through financial faithfulness. Come along for this important study and learn what it means to steward Christ's resources here on earth. Join us for a new It Is Written Sabbath School study each week on itiswritten.tv. Hello, I'm Ed Reed, former director of the Stewardship Department for the North American Division and the author of this quarter's Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide. Managing for the Master Till He Comes. Join myself and it is written associate speaker Eric Flexinger for this quarter's study in which we will learn what the Bible says about faith and finance, digging into the concepts of stewardship, 
and the biblical principles of money management throughout the stages of life. In an age where not only individuals and companies, but also entire cities and states are declaring bankruptcy, the timeliness of this message is more important than ever before. Welcome to Line Upon Line, brought to you by It Is Written. Here at Line Upon Line, we get to answer your Bible questions. Was it God's plan for sin to enter the world? Does that mean that evil spirits exist in human beings? How should we as Christians treat people with different sexual orientations? Is the building of a temple necessary before Jesus returns? I'm struggling with my flesh. I surrendered and failed. Am I lost? That's a good question. And I think we've got a pretty good answer for you here. And that's really what God wants. God just doesn't want us to be healthy. He wants us to also be happy. Let's not spend any more time wondering. Let's instead channel our energy towards believing. It's good to dig into the Bible. Absolutely. Where do we begin? This has been Line Upon Line, brought to you by It Is Written. Welcome back. My guest is Pastor Bill Warchalik. Uh, Bill, I'm really enjoying uh, having you walking me through the way God led in your life. We're not quite up yet to where you became a pastor, but we're getting there. So you've been baptized, your wife is baptized, and now what? Well, they offered training programs. The conference offered training programs for doing Bible studies and doing gospel work of various kinds. I went to any training program I could get. Meanwhile, God was preparing me for my next test because after the day after I was baptized, well, the Monday after I was baptized on that Sabbath, I went into my commander, my flight commander, and I said, sir, um, by the way, I am not going to fly anymore Friday sundown till Saturday sundown. He said, what? And I said, well, sir, I was baptized last week, Seventh-day Adventist, I, so I keep the Sabbath. He said, listen, come into my office. So I came into his office. He told me, sit down. So I sat down. He took out his Bible from the desk that he had. He was a Mormon. And he started flipping through the pages. He said, you don't have to keep the Sabbath. It's, it's okay, it doesn't matter. You know, you're a Christian now. Christians don't have to do that, they do Sunday. And he went on chattering while he was turning through the pages of the Bible. Finally, he closed the Bible. He couldn't find anything about it. And he said, well, I don't care what you do as long as you get your job done. I said, yes, sir, that'll be fine. For the next year, while I was attending training classes for doing evangelist gospel kind of work at the conference, I was also reading through the books. I was reading through the Great Controversy, Desire of Ages, Daniel and Revelation, and other books like that. So I was being filled full until the crisis hit. The crisis hit a year later. And that crisis came about because my flight commander uh, told me one day on a Friday afternoon, I was getting ready to go home for the weekend. And he came up to me and said, uh, Bortolik, we, we, you have to fly this weekend because uh, the other people can't fly for this thing and somebody got sick, so you've got to go and fly. I said, sir, I don't, I don't think I can find a replacement that quickly because I was swapping with people. I'd fly on Sundays for them. They'd fly on Saturdays for me. And I said, sir, I don't think I can find a replacement that fast. And he said, come into my office. He said, listen now, we're not going to put up with this anymore. We're not going to have this anymore of you avoiding. You, you need to fly like everybody else. No exceptions. That's an order. I said, well, sir, um, my religious beliefs do not allow me to do that. And he said, I'm going to go check with the squadron commander. So he went down the hall, talked to the squadron commander, came back. And he said, the squadron commander agrees with me. That's it. We're not putting up with this anymore. You will fly like everybody else. You'll fly on Friday. You'll fly on Saturday. You'll fly on Sunday. Whatever we tell you to do. And I said, sir, my religious beliefs do not allow me to do that. He said, I'm going back to the squadron commander. He went back to the squadron commander. And he came back and he said, you realize this is wartime. We're giving you a direct order. You realize the consequences of that, court martial and other things? And I said, sir, my religious beliefs do not allow me to do that. He said, okay, you're dismissed. We'll deal with you on Monday. As I left the office, he picked up his phone and he said, he called, he said, honey, uh, we have to cancel our plans to Las Vegas for vacation this weekend because I have to fly. I knew I was in big trouble. Oh, so yeah. uh, I went back to church that Sabbath and uh, had everybody pray for me. And I went back on Monday morning. And he said, when I walked in the flight, he said, I'm not talking to you. Go down and see the squadron commander. 
talked to the squadron commander. And he said, uh, are you sure about your decision you're making about this? You know that this is going to have serious consequences? And I said, sir, I'll do whatever you tell me, but I will not violate the commandments of God. Go see the chaplain, he said. <laughs> so I was the chaplain, told my whole story as I'm telling to you. And the chaplain uh, called back, after we were done, called back to squadron CO and said, well, sir, uh, uh, he's sincere in his beliefs. He's not just trying to get out of work. So the squadron CO said to me, uh, he said, well, we don't know what we're going to do with you, but I'll let you know in a week or so. So I went back to work. I had committed to doing an evangelistic series, my first evangelistic series, starting in a couple of weeks. But that's at night. And we, I had to fly. Every other week I had to fly at night. Days, one week, nights the next. And I would have interrupted my part in the evangelistic series that I was preaching for the first time. So amazingly, I got my new assignment, report to the base operations officer. So I did. He said, okay, uh, would it be all right with you if you worked like from 8.30 till 4.30 on uh, Monday through Friday? And um, you can keep your flight pay. Just uh, whenever you want to fly, just get a student and go fly. Just keep up your flight pay. Uh, would that be okay with you? <laughs> I said, of course. Yes, sir. So it, it was such a blessing. I couldn't believe it. What in the world had happened to, 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 to make that possible? What God. in the world? <laughs> There's no question about it. God did that. Uh, really such a, an amazing thing. But Daniel 3, you know, Daniel 1, Daniel 2, Daniel 3, you're faithful, God rewards you. So a few months go by, and I get orders to report to the wing commander, the person in charge of the entire base. And I go, uh oh, they finally found out about me. So I report to the wing commander. He says, and I'm standing at attention to the wing commander's office, he says, Warchalik, we have a problem on this base. I thought, uh oh, he caught up with me. He said, Operations, the pilots, are blaming maintenance for the problem. Maintenance is blaming the pilots for the problem. And this has to be fixed. Because if it isn't fixed, I'm not going to make general. He didn't actually say that, but that, that was what was underlined in, in the point because we had an inspector general uh, coming soon. He said, so from now on, you are my assistant to solve this problem. You have my full authority. Go to anybody in the base as my authoritative representative and fix this problem, whatever it takes. He said, yes, sir. He said, because I know that you'll tell the truth no matter who it irritates. That's what he said. So and That's fantastic, isn't it? Yeah. So now I had the full authority, the wing commander, to, do, to run that aspect of the base. And by the grace of God, was able to use the skills I had cultivated over the years that a pastor needs to find out how get, to get people to work together and to solve the problem. Yeah, that's astonishing. I wonder, I wonder what would have happened if you'd, if you'd said, I'll work this once. Mm, it right. seems to me, and you hear this with, with, with certain stories, when you, when you step out in faith, you give God permission to work. Mm -hmm. Amen. And when you don't, he doesn't. You don't see miracles until you need them. That's right. You know, very often. And it's when you put yourself in that situation and say, like King Jehoshaphat said, there's no hope for us here, but our eyes are on you. Mm -hmm. That's when God can work. Amen. Fantastic. Amen. How do you become a pastor? Oh, no. First question. Why do you become a pastor? I was committed to the gospel preaching from my study in the Bible and that if God could use me as a pastor, I would do it. But even if I weren't a pastor, I kept taking the study classes. Um, I mentioned, or maybe I didn't mention, uh, in that evangelistic series, another lay person who was committed to it and I joined together. We went to this small mining town in Arizona. There was an abandoned Adventist church. So we contacted all the Adventists that were in the community, maybe a handful of people. And I said, we're going to clean up this church and have an evangelistic series. Would you work with us? And they said, sure. We all got working on it. We cleaned up the church, handed out flyers, and held the evangelistic series. How did it go? It went wonderful. The church was opened up. Everything was beautiful. And then we started. We went back to, uh, after that was over, the, uh, we got a new pastor. And he said, I see this church is full and growing. This is wonderful. We're going to plant some churches. And he looked at me and said, you're going to plant a church over in Mesa. And you're going to plant a church over in Apache, somebody else. And so... 
I didn't know that you couldn't do that, so I went over and we planted a church in Mesa. And I've been to that church. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, that, that's a thriving, it's a fabulous con congregation yeah. today. I've, I've, I believe I've preached and it wouldn't be the same church, but the same congregation right. in Mesa, Arizona. Yeah, yeah you know, we, we held se uh, meet meetings in, in Mesa just yeah. not very long ago. Yeah. Fantastic. God is so you were right there. You were part of the, the genesis of all of that. Right. Magnificent. So you, you, were, you were ministering. Mm hmm why did you swing over into full-time ministry, full ministry? The conference in Arizona asked me to, to transition and become a pastor. They asked you? They asked, asked me. And I said, well, I will do that. I, I believe God wants me to become a pastor now. Um, but I said, I have to do one thing first. I have to write back to the conference where I grew up because my family doesn't know about Seventh-day Adventists and my, my friends there don't know about it. So I feel an obligation. So I'll, if they want me to come there, I'll go there, otherwise I'll work here. And? I sent them a letter, and they said, yeah, come over here and help us. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. So you went over to Southern New England? Yeah. Yeah. What did you enjoy about full-time ministry? I love the people. I love working with the people. I like to see um, people working together and getting something done for the glory of God. I like going out and giving Bible studies, because you see the light go on people's yeah. eyes, just like it went on in my sure. eyes. So I love that experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What did you find challenging? Uh, dealing with people. <laughs> <laughs> the same, oh, same yeah. thing that made it great made it challenging too. Exactly. Yeah. But it's, it's really good. You form such good relationships with people, even if you, when you have rough times getting people to work together. You still stay by biblical principles, but you try to be understanding. Where did you spend, physically, geographically, where did you spend most of your pastoral ministry? It was in Connecticut and Rhode Island. Challenging places, you know. I mean, that, you, you don't hear stories of thousands being baptized in a day in Rhode Island or Connecticut. So what was it like working there you know, at, at, the, at the difficult end of the quarry, as it were? I think every place is challenging. I don't mean to intimate they're not, but I mean, the statistics will show you that it's, it's a, a far less churched area of the country than, than many. So what was that like? It's definitely a challenge. But uh, God doesn't tell us to worry about the challenges, just do the work. So I just stay committed. So we're going to do evangelism, we're going to give Bible studies, and if anybody will help me, that'd be great. If you don't, I'm going to do it anyway. Um, but we're going to work together, and we're going to make things happen for the glory of God, because Jesus is coming soon. I might know the answer to this question, and if I do, I might know why the answer is this way. People before they get into ministry might say rose-colored glasses, you get into ministry and you say, hey, some of these people are challenging and some of these challenges are challenging and not everybody acts like a Christian and I thought these were the, 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 the best of the best. Did you ever have any moments of disillusionment when you got into full-time ministry and said, this isn't exactly what I, it's not as perfect as I thought it would be? There were major problems in churches that I pastored um, with personnel at times people who, would, uh, who were church leaders, who were actually uh, told me, well, you can't do this because I don't believe this particular aspect of the church's teachings. Um, and I would have to tell them, you know, I'm going to stay with the teachings that are from the Bible. And if you don't believe them, I'm not sure you're gonna make it as a leader here in this congregation because uh, I won't cite any illustrations, sure. but, uh, you just have to have the internal fortitude and courage to say, no, uh, we're not going to teach that here. We're not going to allow that here in this church. And you have to work with the board and with church leaders. Uh, they, if they're not on board, then you might be looking for another place to pastor. My thinking, too, is that your time in the military, mm -hmm. where you're in a large organization that's got plenty of wonderful things going on inside it and, you know, probably room for improvement here and there. You learn, put a collection of people together and you're going to find imperfections and you know not everybody not everybody is all that they ought to be because people are people mm -hmm. and you'd had a lifetime of learning that you know it also have to have courage and i'll give you maybe two quick illustrations one is a park patrolman because i did maintenance the thing i like to be about being a park ranger is like a pastor you you work on the church projects physically and then you preach and then you go out and visit people so this is your whole ball of wax. Well, as a park ranger, when I worked in the summers as a park ranger, I would work maintenance during the week, and on the weekend I was a patrolman, so I was in charge of supervising and everything. So it was a perfect fit for, uh, for that training to be a pastor. 
I remember walking into a, a, a campsite where we had uh, people who were illegally drinking alcohol, uh, making a mess. And so I've come out of the woods in my uniform and I, all the people are you know, drinking and partying and everything. And I walk up to the, to the fireplace there at the fire pit, which is illegal. And uh, I just stand there and look around. Finally, somebody walks over toward me and I say, this guy must be the leader. And I look at him and I said, you have to clean this place up and leave the park immediately after, right now. And there's like 30 half-drunken teenagers around. And I turned around and walked away. Another time, okay, I was doing a religious program, a drug prevention program in a public inner city high school, hundreds of kids there. The vice principal, the assistant principal, escorts me to the edge of the stage where I'm going to speak from in the auditorium. And he says, by the way, I'm going back to my office. Don't be bothered by the fact that nobody's going to listen to you. And that just don't worry about it. Just say what you have to say and then leave because nobody's going to pay any attention to you. This happens all the time. And he walks away. <laughs> so I walk out on the stage to the microphone. And I'm looking around at the congregation. People are standing up, walking around, little groups congregating here and there. And I just look around. And I start talking very softly. I want to tell you about uh, my friend Joyce. And I just start telling the story of Joyce. And I'm looking out, and in the middle, I see in the middle of the auditorium, one guy sitting down, and he has his lieutenants around him. I'm assuming that. And I start talking directly to him about this person with drug and alcohol problems and stuff and the sadness of it all. I'm looking at him. And as I'm going on quietly, he stands up. Everybody, sit down and shut up. I'm trying to hear what he's saying. Everybody sat down and shut up. You have to have courage to speak the truth, whether people will hear or not. So I had some good training in these different experiences. You've had some great experiences, some, re some remarkable experiences. I wanted to talk about your time working with it as written. You spent some time on our Plan Giving Trust Services team. We, we love it, love you, valued your time here. It was magnificent, but we didn't get a chance to get to that. But that's okay. Last thought, you got about 30 seconds. If someone were to ask you, what does Jesus mean to you? For this wonderful life full of magnificent life experiences where God has clearly guided your life. What does Jesus mean to Bill Wachowski? I look at God as my father, my loving heavenly father. So I'm his child. Remember the vision he gave me. It's all about being a child of a loving heavenly father. And I'm thankful to be part of his family. Amen. I'm thankful you are too, Pastor. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it very much. And thank you for joining us. He is Pastor Bill Warcholik and I'm John Bradshaw. And this has been our conversation. <laughs>